are in Matthew uh, chapter 3, as you can see from our presentation slide there. And we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, this has been a long time coming. We talked about the cross. So the, the Christian calendar being what it is, uh, we a long time ago at this point had Good Friday. We had um, the uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday, Easter. And then we had the 40 days where Jesus showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. And then we talked about the ascension. Uh, and there's been a couple of stutters in there as we walk through that calendar. And then on Pentecost, uh, my brother Kurt over here gave a, a sermon on prayer. And uh, so, yeah, it's been uh, something that I have wanted to then come and um, talk about the Holy Spirit. That's Pentecost, 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. And so uh, now, uh, 70 days after, uh, it's my turn to go ahead and speak to that. So we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And um, I don't know what you think the Holy Spirit does, but can I make a little guarantee for you? The Holy Spirit does more. Okay? Uh, the Holy Spirit does more. With this in mind, let's go ahead then and let's pray and we will move into uh, today's sermon. Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit, we call on you, our God. Thank you. Thank you. We gather together. We put our voices together to sing to you. We put our hearts together to say thank you to you. Lord, you are worthy of so much. You are so good. And Lord, while we can't ever repay, we can't ever give to you what it is that you deserve, we do want to offer up what we have, which is what you have first given. Lord, you've given to us our life and our breath. We want to offer life and breath back up to you in praises, in song, in worship, in our lives lived. We want to uh, offer to you, Lord, our energies, which you first gave to us, uh, the the. Uh, uh, tithes and offerings, that's, it's us trying to offer back to you what you've first given uh, to us. We want to offer uh, to you, Lord, from uh, who we are. You've created us for yourself. You desired us. You're the one that knit us together. You're the one that made us. And, Lord, flaws and everything, we just give to you uh, the real us. Here we are uh, offering to you what it is that we have, what you've given to us first. And any goodness, Lord, is because you... Through your Son, you, God, uh, you have shed the blood and have applied it to us. And again, all we have to offer you is what you've first given to us. So we, we return um, to you the, the praises for the shed blood. We return to you these hearts that have been changed by the shed blood. We give to you lives that have been changed by the shed blood. And now, being filled with the Holy Spirit, we come to you, filled with the Spirit, to give to you our Spirit-filled hearts and souls and minds and lives. Here we are, and this is, this is us. This is what we are. As weak as we are, as frail as we are, as limited as we are, uh, if I understand you correctly, that's all you want is just the real us. And so, God, here we are, uh, weak as frail, offering to you um, the real us. Here we are. Please now, God, not only receive us, but then please give to us more. As you have already given, God, continue to give to us. As you have given to us the Holy Spirit, I ask you to continue making that fresh press, that fresh, that fresh uh, endowment of your spirit. Help us to understand and appreciate. Help us to worship you rightly. And now, Lord, as we are gathered together, uh, fill us for your name's sake. We pray it all through your Holy Spirit and in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in Matthew uh, chapter 3, and I want to point out to you several things that are uh, going on here. We're getting ready to watch Jesus being baptized my emphasis here this morning is not about baptism. Uh, that, that's, that's not what uh, today is about. 
I want you to pay attention to some of the, uh, the periphery. And sometimes we see these things and we don't know what's going on and we may be just like sort of read over it and ignore it. Maybe sometimes uh, we don't ignore it, but we scratch our heads and say, what in the world is going on here? Uh, so we're going to read over it and we're going to try to take a closer look. So here we are at Matthew chapter 3 and starting at verse uh, 13. Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, Permit it at this time, for... So the word for, so that you know, is almost like the author is waving a little flag and says, explanatory note, explanatory note. Uh, that's what the word for means. It's because, or I made this statement. Now, explanatory note, hey, everybody, pay attention. Here's what's actually going on behind that. So John, as he is speaking, Matthew, being a good historian, writes down what's, be, what's taking place here. He says, um, Jesus answering said to him, permitted at this time, and here's why. In this way, it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Okay, lots of nutty things are happening. We're not going to be able to talk about all of them, however. So I want you guys to remember, I, I gave an illustration a while ago, and uh, I want you to keep this in mind. The heavens are not actually up there. The same word, uranos, is used to say sky. Uranos, it's the up there part. So there's the, in Greek, it's called the air. And then there's the, uh, what is the word for that? Aether, aether. And then above that is the uranos. Okay, so the sky, the way up there part. The reason why that is called the same word that is used for heaven is because the way that the analogy in language goes, we use analogies in language all the time. We talk about like earth shattering events and stuff. We don't actually mean the earth got broken up. That's not what we're saying, right? So the way that we use language is that uh, there's this heaven, this dimension where God is, where God is uh, present. Who thinks that God is not present on the earthly plane? right? I mean, God is clearly present on the earthly plane. But there is a place that God can be, that God can reach, that God can hang about, if you will, that is not available to us. And I want you to think about it sort of sideways. We talked about that when we talked about the ascension, that you don't necessarily need to think of Jesus as floating away into the sky, but that Jesus was sort of received into a cloud and just enveloped here on terra firma and was taken up into heaven right across horizontally speaking. The reason I think that's important is because of what's going on here, one of the reasons. The analogy is this. Heaven is right on top of us. It's with us. It is not far off. You know, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, King, you better watch yourself because there's a God in heaven. What he is not saying is there's a God way, way far away and sometimes he sort of reaches over and he sort of fiddles with stuff. That's not what he's saying. He says there's a God in heaven, which means he's right here. He is on top of you and you can't reach him, but he can reach you. Okay, so there is this other I, I, I'm really reticent to use this kind of language, but please go with me and if there's questions, ask them. There's this other dimension that is right here, right now, with us, present, among us, okay? Another example of this is when Elisha has his servant Gehazi, and they're being surrounded by the enemy, and Gehazi looks out and he says, look at all of the soldiers that are coming, I'm uh, scared. And then uh, Elisha, that's, it's, some things are lost in translation, but that's what it says. 
Uh, and Elisha says, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see that those who are with us are more numerous than those that are with them. And it's not that uh, chariots of fire came. It's that his eyes were open and he could see that there already were these angelic hosts, this military, uh, uh, angelic military that was there with the flaming chariots and the silver. They already were there. And now he sees as they're the, oh, and he feels a little, I am less a scared now. And uh, he didn't get over it entirely, but still. Okay, so there's this other dimension that is right on top of us that we can't reach. So there's the sky. It's right there. And I just, I, the problem is, is I just, I can't, I can't get it. I can't reach it. So I climb a tree and I, well, I still can't get it. And then I, I climb a mountain and I get up to the, and I like, even if I jump, I still like, I still can't, it's right here. It's right on top of me. But I, I just, I never can get it, right? So God is in heaven. It's right on top of us but I just, I can't quite get it, even though it's right on top of us, okay? That's kind of the image, that's kind of the picture, and it was intended, uh, that, that use of the word uranos, the sky, is supposed to say that there's this layer, if you will, that's right on top of us, that we just can't apprehend it, we can't grasp it, we can't get it, right? Okay, so then, here is Jesus, he comes along, and he is going to be baptized, and it is not the baptism per se. You know, here is this, uh, he's, there's no sin in Jesus, so he's certainly not being baptized for repentance, which is what John's uh, baptism was, a baptism of repentance. So he's certainly not doing that. That's not what he's doing, not repenting or anything like that. Uh, we'll talk about that another time, because again, the baptism is not the point of what I'm talking about, but rather, what happens is that John the Baptist, the forerunner, the one who goes before Jesus, making the announcement of comfort, oh, comfort my people, says Isaiah chapter 40, because here he is. You will see your God face to face, eye to eye. He's, okay, so here comes John. He's the forerunner. He's the announcer. He's the one who, he takes Jesus and he baptizes him and he comes up. And what happens is that unapproachable distant place heaven is going to open up and we're going to see something happen. So you guys will know that in the book of Genesis, there's something that happens right up at the very beginning that causes a separation, a chasm, a distance, brings sin and puts it in between so that now we can't get into God's space the way that we once could when we were in Edom. Eden. Uh, Adam and Eve ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil after being prohibited from doing so. They take a bite of this thing, and when God shows up, he doesn't call it the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, have you eaten of the fruit of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The name of this thing changes in order to indicate you did something. And when they did, they put this divide between, and geographically, there is a... There is literally a geographic distance that's put between Eden and where they are. They are pushed out of, but that is there in order to, the, like the next step to that is to represent that there is a distance now between being able to meet and convene with God. And from there out, God has to come to them and God has to come and say, uh, like when he talks to Cain, for instance, Hey, sin is crouching at the door, but you had better master this thing, because uh, if you don't, and Cain doesn't, so forth. But there's a distance that is between now um, God and man. This distance sin, this chasm that is, we can't overcome it. We can't just go barging into the heavenly realm. We can't walk into God's space the same way that we once uh, could as we shared space when heaven and earth were all together in this one God space, man space. We're in Eden. We share together this being together. Distance now. All right. So there's a distance. And this distance is being represented. Now, I want you to know this literally happened. Okay. Here is Jesus in the water. Here is the sky. The sky divides and literally a, um, the, the spirit in the form of a dove comes down. These things literally happen, but I want you to see that the reason why it's taking place like this is because there's a distance between God and man, between the heavenly realm and the earthly realm, if you will, and now what, there is a, 
a, a re-performance, if you will. The uh, author, Matthew, is an excellent author. There are so many subtleties brought in where he takes from the Old Testament and he says, let me not only just say, this was a re-performance of the Exodus by Jesus. Like, where's the poetry in that, right? So he says, let me tell you a little story and I want you to see it and feel it and live in it and then kind of, there you go. So Jesus is re-performing the Exodus. He is, okay, uh, real quick, real fast. He um, was in the wilderness for 40 days, right? Not 40 years, but he was in the wilderness for 40 days. He's in the wilderness. And then he comes to where? He comes to the Jordan River. Does that sound familiar? Sure does. Goes from the Jordan River. And as John the Baptist is taking people, they're going then into the promised land, Israel, the, the, right, the nation. So it is a re-performance of the Exodus. Here comes Jesus from the wilderness to the Jordan River, but now the Jordan River is not what divides. It is the heavens that divide. It is not going from the wilderness to the promised land that the waters are divided to make a way through from wilderness to promised land. It is now the heavens that are divided and opened up. There's no way for us to get from here to there. So what God does is there's another re-performance that is taking place here. The Holy Spirit comes down. This is not only the re-performance of the Exodus. And for those of you who have questions, stick around afterwards. That's fine. Uh, it's not the waters that divide, taking them from being slaves to being free in their land. It is now the heavens that divide. And it's not calling man out like in the Exodus when they came out of Egypt, it's not calling man out, it's calling God in. The Exodus is a, it's a different, it's a whole nother layer. It is a whole nother thing here. It is not just a matter of we are taking the people from being in Egypt because what we saw, you can take the slave out of Egypt, but you have a hard time taking the Egypt out of the slave, right? And so now what we have is, is that God says, okay, I, the divide that's going to happen is that heaven is going to be opened and God, it's not calling man out, it's calling God in. God is coming to where we are, okay? So here comes the Holy Spirit and we are the people who are then, uh, by way of the new covenant, filled with the Holy Spirit. We are saved by believing on Jesus Christ and we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and that's the marker. You get the Holy Spirit. You can't be unsaved. He's not going to yield his territory. God then also performs the act of uh, re-performance of Noah in the ark. Uh, Noah, you may remember, he opens his little door. He's floating around in the boat. There's the water. The water abates. It's no good. It's very bad. It's sinful. It's tragic. There's death. There's wreckage. There's rot. There's, there's decrosion. De I'm making a word up. Decrosion. There's decrosion, people. It's terrible. And uh, so then Noah on the inside, first he sends out a raven, right? But ravens, they are carrion eaters, Okay, but then Noah, that's not good enough, so he's going to take a, uh, a dove, and he, takes, he opens up the door to his little ark where his space, separate from where death and degradation and decomposition and, de what was the word I came up with earlier? Decrosion. Uh, he, he now takes this delicate-footed dove, and he sends the dove out. And at first, the dove goes out, and it returns. There's no place for the delicate dove who does not eat carrion to lay its foot, okay? But then he sends it out the second time and the dove goes and finds a place to land and remain. God the Father, he's in his ark, if you will. No, that's not what it says. I know that's not what it says, but he's in his space and he opens the door and he lets out a dove and the dove comes and is there any place on the whole earth, is there any place in this land of decrosion? <laughs> oh, you get it, right? That where, where there's rot and refuse and death and tragedy. Is there anywhere where the Holy Spirit could possibly land? And the answer is, there is one point. There is 
one single place in all of creation and it's going to be the initiating starting point and there's going to be something that happens right here don't see this as Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit that's not right Jesus is not receiving the Holy Spirit in fact the Holy Spirit is referred to as the Spirit of Christ if you like example would be Romans chapter 8 and you should read that it's very good stuff but <clears throat> instead in, in the same way it's not like heaven is losing the Holy Spirit right I mean so it's not like Jesus is gaining the Holy Spirit and it's not like heaven is losing the Holy Spirit that's not the point but rather what we see here is this wonderful thing I'm gonna to try to illustrate it for you this way there is a uh, you guys know who Yosemite Sam is taught me how to cuss that guy that guy uh, so there's Yosemite Sam and are you guys familiar with his twin brother Ike Yosemite Ike he has a black mustache and he it looks exactly like uh, Yosemite Sam but he's got black hair instead of red hair are you guys familiar with all right you need to watch more cartoons <laughs> Okay, so anyhow, there's uh, Yosemite Sam over here, and there's the Grand Canyon, and then there's Yosemite Ike, and he's on the other side of the Grand Canyon. And in the way that only Yosemite Sam could do, he gets his lasso, and he, and he sends it across the Grand Canyon, and on the other side of this puppy is Ike, and he takes hold of the rope, and he's got it on this side, and they both lean back into their heels and give it a yank, and the two sides of this chasm <laughs> shut, and now you've got the two, and they're next to each other because the chasm's been closed. You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, in their own wisdom, in their own counsel, they say there is a huge chasm here of sin. How are we going to possibly get that end of the chasm over here how are we going to get this end of the chasm over there and Jesus says I will go over there and he is born of a virgin and he comes as a small child and he lives and he is raised up and he lives a perfect human life and so he's on one side of the chasm heaven now because man cannot reach heaven man can't do that that dimension so heaven says I will send my son and he places his son on that side of the chasm and now as Jesus is on that side of the chasm now from this side of the chasm God the Father says I will open up over here and I will Holy Spirit as a dove he casts his lasso to the other side and now Jesus is the one point on man's plane and God the Father on the other side and the Holy Spirit is that connector between the two and in the work that only God could do they are going to close that chasm they're gonna bring the two sides together and there is a way from here to there now that we can do because the work of God through the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit the work that the Holy Spirit has done here is is, is an initiatory work this is a first work of many now follow this this is not in this text I'm borrowing from a lot of things once again if you have questions come ask me I promise I'm not being I'm a little weird but not really so you have then the beginning where God on this side okay or this side we let's just pretend for a second the heaven is in the sky it's not holy cow uh, that that you've got this God is up there you now have Jesus as a man God is down here then you have the Holy Spirit comes and he touches on a single point Jesus and Jesus is the point of renewal the point of uh, where where the heaven and earth are connected now he is the point it was supposed to be the temple of God the temple of God was supposed to be where you could go to find the presence of God but the temple has become corrupted remember he's gonna go throw over some tables and say this place is a den of thieves so now Jesus is the touch point where heaven and earth connect and now we do have an earthly representative in heaven and a heavenly representative on earth how does that work Jesus lives his perfect life but he dies as the Savior for all of us and it's not by accident and it's not a oh that's too bad for Jesus he did it quite on purpose the resurrected Jesus a yes he's divine but a human being the human being Jesus watch this you remember that divide that happened we now have God sent over here to this side and now God in Jesus is here he dies he resurrects 
he, the Holy Spirit has been right here, this guy, when he then ascends to the throne, a human being from this side comes over to this side. So now we have not only that God has come over here, but now a human being has now come over here. And 10 days after Jesus ascends, he then sends the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is being sent. And now whatever that divide is, multiple holes are now perforating that divide between as the Holy Spirit now goes from the throne of God and is sent to every single individual believer and they become the touch point of where heaven meets earth. We now have the presence of God is present with men, not to the full extent that it's going to be, right? But what we are seeing is, is that as people are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, the final judgment, which is in the future, that final judgment is already being met. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I am worthy of dying. Lord, I know that you should cast me aside because of the wretchedness of my sin, right? But you, Lord, you have sent Jesus for me. And because you have sent Jesus for me, I can be saved. And I don't need to wait until I die to stand at the judgment throne to find out whether or not I'm going to be received. You can be assured, if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ for your salvation, you can be assured of that future event, Judgment Day, today. The future is picked up and it is brought back and the judgment is laid down. The Lord vindicates you. You have been found, the court has found in your favor, you are not condemned. That's also Romans chapter 8. But not only is that the case, but what happens when you die, when you face the judgment, when the Lord says you are vindicated, you are mine, come uh, 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 good and faithful servant and taste of the fruit of the master. Like these sort of, what happens then? You live with God forever. Well, once again, living with God forever is picked up and brought back and placed on top of you because the Holy Spirit has come. Judgment has already been met. The presence of God is already being given. And as the foretaste or as the down payment, as the Holy Spirit is called, you are receiving the Holy Spirit and you're going to get the fullness of the inheritance when comes Christ's return, the resurrection of the body. And we are going to live with God perpetually in that eternal state and that is going to be fantastic but we are not left without that foretaste so Jesus being baptized is the the, the like the pinpoint the the one you've got the entire earth is dark and corrupt and essentially flooded with sin and shame and degradation and rot and greed and pride and you get it and there is one point it is the person of Jesus Christ. And from that one point, there is not only a revolution, not only a revival, there is renewal, there is new life, there is the fresh outbreaking of this new life that has been promised and through Jesus and then as the Holy Spirit is given to the believers, now there's multiple of these things and as it goes worldwide, you'll be my representatives uh, sharing my message from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the other parts of the world, the, it's going worldwide. We then, the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit is housed, we are all over the world, and the world is now being uh, permeated by, and the job's not done yet, but we, the world is being permeated by these points of light, these points of life, these points where there is the revival, the, the points where the, the revolution has already taken place. I am part of the created order that has been renewed in Jesus. So one day when Jesus returns, he is going to renew all things. The best way I've ever heard it put is, the thief is not allowed to keep what he stole. The devil does not get to just ruin. You guys do realize Genesis chapter one, it is good. Second day, it's good. It's good. Actually, the second day, I need to take that back because on the second day, it doesn't say it's good. But he says it's good twice on the third day. So then it's good, it's good. And then fourth day, it's good. Fifth day, it's good. Sixth day, it's good. Seventh day, it's very good. The thief does not get to just destroy that. And God goes, oh, that's too bad. Oh, well. 
No, he is going to take back for himself what was his. He is going to revitalize, reclaim. There's going to be new life. And again, with the Romans chapter 8, we see there, I'm not talking about it, I'm reading it. Because uh, you guys need to see this. Romans chapter 8, before that, before that, before that, before after that, before that. There we are. Okay. Uh, Romans chapter 8. Um, yeah, go to verse 19. So Romans chapter 8, verse 19. Uh, so as he's explaining how there's no longer any condemnation, there's no longer this degradation. You remember how Romans chapter 8 begins, therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? That's not just the, okay, but uh, verse 19. For, as he explains it, the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. We are then being the multiplied... Um, presence of Jesus as we have the spirit of Jesus in us so that we then are being adopted in as the children of God for we know that the whole creation groans suffers the pains of childbirth until now and not only this but we also ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons the redemption of the body for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he already sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. In the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we don't even know how to pray as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Jesus when he came, he made that initiating move where God has come to man, where man now, there was an obedient Jew that did what he was supposed to do from the line of David, as a, as from the line of Judah, from uh, the line of David, all the way up through, and this perfect man made a way for God in his space and man in his space to be connected. One more time. Jesus then goes to the ascension onto the throne of the, of next to the Father, the throne of heaven. The Holy Spirit is sent. That wall, that dividing wall is riddled with holes to the point where it can't, if it keeps happening like it's happening, Holy Spirit breaking through, that wall is not going to be able to re retain a division between. The Holy Spirit comes over here. We then, as Jesus returns, we are going to be resurrected, new bodies, and we're going to watch as creation and all of us are going to be uh, restored to heaven. And the two are, um, you remember that Ephesians chapter 5, after talking about husbands and wives, he says... Uh, that this is actually an analogy about Jesus and the church and the two shall become one. There's going to be this gathering. We don't become God. We don't become God. We don't become God. That's not it. But the two are brought together and unified. And now we are going to have God. We have the foretaste now in the Holy Spirit. And we need to live that way. But we are going to have the presence of God absolutely on top of us, together with us, inseparably so. And in the Holy Spirit's doing, the Holy Spirit brings to us that foretaste of what is still to come. And Jesus, this is my son in whom I am well pleased, Jesus makes a way that we can have the adoption as children and that we can be brought into the family and we can have the assurance now, even though we're on this side of the divide, we can have the assurance now of what the future holds because we have that foretaste and we celebrate what it is that God has done and what it is that God is going to do. And now it's up to you what you do 
now, but it is the Holy Spirit who strengthens you, and it is the Holy Spirit who gives you your tasks and your role and your place as family. And so now, together, we are family. Together, we are the bearers of that light. We are the bearers of the name of the Father. And now, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but live accordingly. <laughs> so, it's not about being good, though. It is about loving the Lord. Listen, it's about loving the Lord in front of people. And if you will simply receive the love that he has given, and if you will simply love him back, the world can't stop us from changing it and letting love lead the way. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your spirit and for the work that you have done in your own wisdom, in your own counsel. Thank you that you've allowed for us to be a part of it and help us to get a hold of that, that uh, there's more to living this Christian life than just waiting for heaven. Lord, we, your people, we are ready now. We are ready now. This world needs us right now to be the children of God. This world needs us right now. There's so much degradation and rot and putrefaction. Lord, help us that we would be the aroma of life. Help us that we would be the children that the world needs to steward this world properly. Uh, not just in the ecological resources and whatnot, but rather that we would be the stewards who are here to shine your light out onto the world and shine the praises of the world uh, to you. Give to us, Lord. Give to us graciously. Give to us abundantly. Help us to see you and to know you and to uh, receive your forgiveness and your graces. We pray it, Lord, knowing that you've already begun it, knowing that you are definitely going to uh, bring it to its proper uh, final way. Help us in the here and now uh, as we search for the right way of living and loving you and our fellow man, praising you as we stumble and fumble our way through it in the name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>